Hi, this is Starkey Sowers. Welcome to the Nutrition Mission Podcast from Clark's Nutrition and Natural Foods Market. So the idea of this, Jessica, is to bring all sorts of things to the public's view as well as to some audible situations. So if you're driving down the road or you're doing this, you can listen to some of the episodes. We're going to have all sorts of topics, everything from like tea to sports nutrition to keto diets and the popular diets of the time. You're excited for this. So excited. So make sure you guys subscribe to our channel and you can go find us on YouTube, like Starkey said. So are you guys ready? All right. We're all about the nutrition, nutrition mission. mission. All right. So today's episode is about pre-workouts. So I'm like a, a fan of pre-workouts. Always have been a fan of pre-workouts. And uh, but I, I think it's kind of good to maybe develop some ideas on pre-workouts. So maybe you know the ingredients on pre-workouts, so you can make a decision. By the way, I bought, brought a bunch of pre-workouts with me. One of the things that you've noticed throughout the years is a lot of the pre-workouts have morphed, and I'll talk a little bit about that. What I mean by morph is they changed a lot. And the reason why they've changed is because some ingredients go in vogue, some ingredients go out of vogue, things of that nature. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to talk about some old school ones as well as some, you know, maybe some brand, some ingredients. I wouldn't say necessarily that they're branded ingredients, but they're ingredients that have kind of stayed in most pre-workouts. So maybe you understand what they are or how they got there. And then uh, what we'll do is we're going to actually critically evaluate. I think I brought like six different pre-workouts over here, and we're going to go through each one of them and talk about why this one would work, how it would work, and so some things for you to look for when you're buying a pre-workout, all right? So is there anything new about pre-workouts? I would suggest that that saying is no. And the reason why is because pre-workouts ultimately have been around forever, and there are different types of things, obviously herbs. I didn't bring a lot of herbs with me. We will talk about some of the herbs. Um, and what I want to do is almost kind of like give you a little history lesson on pre-workouts as well. So as far as I can recollect, being like the 70s and on, right? Okay, so one of the pre-workouts, that I, and let's talk about fun pre-workouts. I think this is always good. Um, so one of the best pre-workouts that I was told about years ago was eating tacos before a workout. I'm telling you, that was like, to me, one of the best gut aches I ever had. But I, I'm telling you, it was like one of the, so, you know, in the gym, especially in the seventies and stuff like that, you would hear about all these different things, you know, Hey, try this and do that and drink coffee or drink tea or whatever you got caffeine wise. Uh, of course, remember back in the 70s, bennies or whites or ephedrines, of course, were legal. Sometimes people would take those, and of course, your heart would palpitate for like 15 hours after using it. Great workout, but man, the recovery was crazy. But anyways, so one time, a guy told me, he goes, yeah, you need protein, you need fats. And I'm not disputing this factor because it actually pre-workout protein like an hour before is amazing for like recovery and repair and things of that nature. But anyways, this guy's mode was like, let's eat tacos, right? So it's like we ate like five or six deep fried tacos right before training. And I'm here to tell you um, it wasn't the best pre-workout. It definitely gave me a gut ache. But if I backed it up and ate them an hour before, it actually worked pretty darn good. So... A lot of times I think one of the things we want to remember is whatever floats your boat maybe is like, it's going to be good. So before we get that far, I think it's important to understand what is known as an ergogenic aid. Every now and then you'll hear that term used. And usually it's like some science guy throwing something around. An ergogenic aid is anything that you're going to use that's going to enhance physical performance in the capacity of exercise, right? So obviously for years, one of the components on that was anabolic steroids. Um, by the way, you might be surprised how many people use anabolic steroids in all sorts of realms. This is not a show about anabolic steroids. You know, I, in fact, I'll make a promise now. We will cover that topic at one time. Anyways, but let's just kind of whittle the cock, clock back to the 70s. And so one of the things I was really kind of intrigued about back in the 70s was this guy named Bradley J. Steiner. He was kind of like the authority in the late 60s and the 70s on sensible training. And one of the things he always recommended was this. It's basic old ginseng paste, right? And so if you look at this, this is like a little, little jar. In fact, I'll open it up for those that you guys have the visual capacity. But ginseng, as we know, of course, has is, is got all sorts of things for endurance and stamina, also like for hormone production, as well as like recovery and things of that nature. But you look at this, and this is what he recommended, him and a couple other different guys recommended this paste, and it's literally a paste. And so ultimately, you were supposed to take some of this paste and use it pre-workout. So a bunch of us started getting into this. 
like in the late 70s and the early 80s. For lack of better terms, when you look at this, it's literally like tar. You know, so here it is. It's got like a tarish looking substance. It's a very highly concentrated ginseng. And you take it before a workout, and we noticed like in no time, after a couple of weeks of using it, we had increased endurance and stamina. And like we were tearing the gym up and loving it, right? So he also recommended maybe that you took it with a little bit of caffeine, use it with a combination together. So the other thing that you have to remember is a lot of this folklore stuff eventually got science behind it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well, too. So one of the things, like I said, was ginseng was out on the market. The other thing that was out on the market that you just, it was like, man, if you weren't taking desiccated liver tablets, you just weren't there. I mean, you, you just, it was a known factor that if you're not using liver, guess what? You're probably just missing the boat on your training. In fact, you're going to not only miss the boat on the training, you're, you're just going to ne not make the progress the guy next to you is making. How much liver would you use? Six, 10, 12? Well, ironically speaking, one of the guys that made it so popular was a gentleman by the name of Vince Gerondo. You guys have heard me talk about him before. And by the way, I promised to do a series on Vince Gerondo, so that's coming. So Vince Gerondo, he was called the Iron Guru. He was up in uh, Studio City. He trained all the stars of the day. So, you know, Clint Eastwood was up there. Carl Weathers, you know, the nemesis in Rocky, as well as like the Dukes of Hazards, Cheech and Chong trained up there, as well as uh, Bruce Lee, if you guys are into any type of you know, karate movies and things of that nature was up there. Um, all the stars that you could think of were training at Vince's. And so Vince always recommended liver. In fact, one of the things he said was this, if you're using liver and you, you want to use, you, know, you want to put an inch on your arms, he said, take two liver tablets every hour that you're awake for like one month straight. And at the end of one month, you will put an inch on your arm. And so one of the things that was so unique about that, when we look back in retrospect, we actually know that liver, of course, had creatine in it and using creatine on a regular basis works. So what did he knew? He knew this. He knew like there were some studies out of the 1930s and 1940s. And they actually showed where they took rats and they like fed them like, here's your vegetarian diet. Here's a vegetarian diet with some beef. Here's another situation where you take vegetarian diet and you add liver. And when they used liver, the growth of the rats was accentuated dramatically. And so they were like, you know what? Ultimately, if you're going to like have an animal that you want to raise and have it to actually, you know, have any type of growth patterns that exceed the normal thing, you got to put desiccated or, or actually maybe back in those days some raw liver. And so those were some of the studies that were being done. And they were actually legitimate studies. They're still found on PubMed. You can actually dig them up and, and uh, kind of look them up. And my, if it's not on PubMed, uh, uh, double check Google Scholar. I found them this morning. They're kind of still hanging out there. Finally, another study that was done was an endurance study that was done at USC. And the gentleman actually did some research on it and actually showed that, you know, he would take these rats and feed them different diets and put them in water and let them swim until they almost drowned. And ultimately, the group that had the desiccated liver literally swam three to four times the length or duration, so to speak, that the other ones could go. All right. So I think liver ends up still being on the shelves effectively. In fact, we're seeing an incredible resurgence in the use of liver today. So how would you use desiccated liver pre-workout? Well, it's really oftentimes not necessarily a pre-workout. It's something you consume throughout the whole day. And if you were going to do a pre-workout with it, maybe an hour before would be the perfect way to use desiccated liver as a pre. Obviously with the ginseng, it's something you can use right away, right before it. All right. So here's another one that had some great popularity was bee pollen. And so some of the current studies say now, in fact, the International Society of Sports and Nutrition says, look, hey, conclusively, we can just say bee pollen is not an ergogenic aid. But I, I just kind of wrote a couple of notes down here. One of the things that we do know is bee honey actually increases endurance and stamina in the elderly. Bee pollen itself is said to have a rich amount of antioxidants. The other thing is, as well as actually has a presence in developing a healthier person and multiple reasons for that. First of all, high in polyphenols. What are polyphenols? Those are the things that you find in red wine, things that you find in green tea, the things that you find in different colored fruits and vegetables, anti-inflammatory principles as well. So maybe they missed the boat. Instead of using bee pollen pre-workout, maybe you were supposed to use a post for recovery. The other thing is this, and it also has phytosterols on it. And I think we knew that and we talked about that so much back in the day. And it was like, 
phytosterol. So think of that word, phyto, as a plant sterile. So we thought sterile steroids, man, anything that's a sterile, we're going to consume it. If it's cardboard, it's got sterols, bring it on, let's eat cardboard. We'll do whatever we got to do, right? And so this stuff had phytosterols in it. So we were going to just like consume it because it had the phytosterols. It's going to make us big. Of course, you know, we're eating five, eight ounces of this stuff a day and we're like having, having like symptoms of like, you know, dry mouth and all the fun stuff. But the bottom line is bee pollen not only is good for you, has benefits. And someday we actually might see some research that would say, eh, maybe, maybe it's an ergogenic aid. Ultimately, it's definitely a good nutrient to have. All right. So then this is kind of a new, like updated version of like things that were old that became new. In China, for years, cordyceps, you've heard me talk about cordyceps before. So cordyceps ultimately helps as far as what the Chinese call a yin and yang stabilizer. A couple of unique things that pop up with the research on, on cordyceps. 1990s, 92, Chinese swimmers, you know, the Chinese finally get to the Olympics, and they start dominating in some areas. And one of the areas that they dominated was long, long distance running, and they also started dominating specifically in swimming. And so they found out that these guys were using cordyceps. Well, what are cordyceps? They're basically a fungus that grows grows on caterpillar crap, okay? So I know that sounds graphic and all that sort of stuff, but you won't forget. And so there's different types of these cordyceps, though. There are Tibetan types, there's harvested types, all these other different things. The problem that you run into, there's some quality stuff differences that you end, end up with these this stuff. So here's the problem that you end up with. Can you buy cordyceps? Yeah, you can buy cordyceps. So the good stuff, it's about 2000 bucks a kilo. So if you're going to get the real effect of cordyceps, you've got to buy the good stuff. In fact, the good stuff has actually shown to increase Lydic cell activity. So what are Lydic cells? Those are the testosterone-producing cells in the testes of males, all right? So it's like, okay, we even know that this stuff can actually kick up T levels, right? So ultimately what happens is, how do we make it cheaper? So what they do is, you know, they bring it to the United States. They try growing it on, I don't know, wood, pulp, wood chips. I don't know, whatever they came up with. And they grew it, and it worked. And, of course, it bombs on all the studies. Well, they find out that the type that they had specifically needed a new, different nutrient situation. The other thing that they found out was this, is the particular strains that they were getting weren't the authentic strains that really made the difference. So they get the authentic strain. They get this, the medium to grow it on properly. And they label this, and basically they call it CS4. And so if you're ever going to buy cordyceps, here we have one from Paradise Herbs, you want the CS4 because that's the legit stuff. You actually take that stuff, you actually feel it, unless you can buy the $2,000 kilo stuff. So where would you get that? There's only two different people that know that have the decent stuff. Number one is Herbal Regenesis, which is Chin Lee down in uh, Redondo Beach. She has it and a product called Muscle Booster. The other guy, Ron Teagarden, uh, uh, which is Dragon Herbs. He's up in Santa Monica, Venice. He's actually got some good stuff. All, both of those items typically we carry in the store, so that's kind of a cool item. All right, so cordyceps is definitely like the new slash old. I mean, it was thousands of years old, used by Chinese athletes for years, ultimately being one of the new things that hits like in the 90s, right? All right, so the, the 90s and, and definitely the, the early 2000s kind of exploded in what I call ergogenic research. And what they did is they started looking at a lot of different things and said, you know what? That's not an ergogenic aid, chuck it. That's not an ergogenic aid, chuck it. If it doesn't have enough research or if it doesn't stack up to ergogenic aid, it maybe has no purpose. Ultimately, some of the things do, but ultimately some of the things don't. So let's talk about some new stuff and old stuff, all right? First of all, let's go with beta alanine. How many people have like done a pre-workout and all of a sudden they get this red, tingly, kind of itchy feeling? They call it parathesis is the name of the word. It's a technical name for dude, you itch, right? So here's the problem that happens with beta alanine is it causes parathesis. The reason why beta alanine basically is a compound that's a, a coupled agent. It has, has an amino, two amino acids that are uh, bound together. Uh, specifically, what, what the happens with the alanine along with the carnosine, it makes up what is known as carnosine compound. It actually releases histidine or histamines, and that's where the parathesis comes in. It's a little bit like niacin. In my opinion, niacin's a little bit more dramatic, but, and I actually like the effect of both of them. So Beta alanine, so here, and I probably should put a little caveat out there with this. Here's a problem that you run into when you release histamines. First of all, when you release histamines, oftentimes it can be a vasodilator. Hey, that's a great thing. The other thing that people don't realize is this. When you release histamines, it actually releases also serotonins. 
And so when I started playing with this stuff, I was in a, in a basketball league, 35 and over. And so, you know, a lot of times we'd get these late nights and it was on a Tuesday. I go to work early, like 3.34 in the morning. I get home, kind of work all day after I worked all day at the work and then go like play an 11 o'clock or a 10 o'clock game at night with a bunch of these guys. So I would thought, well, I'll use some beta alanine. So I take some beta alanine and literally I, all I could think of is like, I want to just go over the corner over there and go to sleep. So one of the things that happens in most pre-workouts, obviously, is they combine beta alanine with other different things so you don't get that release so much of the serotonin. Typically, one of the things you'll see is they'll put in caffeine. Anyways, let's get to what beta alanine does. So beta alanine is a little tricky. You literally got to consume 149 grams of this stuff to be effective. So now here's the caveat. And I've got a, a bottle in front of me right here. So how much does this stuff weigh? 200 grams. So you literally almost have to consume this jar. That doesn't mean that you're going to have to consume the jar, the jar literally in one setting. Here's how it works. You got to take four to six grams on a daily basis, like five days a week, and build the levels up in the body. You can't just hit 200 grams of this stuff. It's just going to flush right through you. So what happens when you use this stuff, what it does is it builds up in the body. And what it does is it buffers hydrogen ions. And what does that mean? It means this. It recycles or recirculates and prevents the breakdown of ATP and creatine phosphate. Okay? So ultimately what that means is you're going to have ATP levels in the system longer. How long? two to four minutes, which is the immediate, or what we call the immediate energy system. And so what happens in that situation, it's going to increase the propensity for your two to four minute workout, okay? Or your two, two to four minute situation. So what does that translate into? Wrestlers. Also like MMA fighters. The other thing it's going to go into is mid-range sprinters or sprinters in general. It's also going to work for the guy that's in the gym that's trying to get one more rep on his bench press or on his squats or things of that nature. And ultimately, that's where you're going to see the difference be. So that's where that particular product really seems to shine. Now, let's say you're an ultra endurance exerciser you know what? You're probably not going to get a whole lot of benefit from beta alanine. So you'll see it slip into those pre-workouts. And ultimately, a lot of times people go, you know, what's the benefit? In my opinion, this is a great agent to use, especially pre-workout. Now, here's the deal. It's going to be in that sprinting. It's going to be in that shot putting. It's going to be also in that like track and field. That's, you know, less than like maybe a mile or a mile and less and things of that nature perfect in those zones where it's not going to be perfect. Like I said, the ultra endurance guy, it just really doesn't have a purpose. All right. All right. So that said, I also want to kind of kick in a couple other little endurance moments. One here, I didn't bring a bottle of creatine. So I thought I'd just talk about it because it's always in these pre-workouts. So here's a great one right here. This particular pre-workout has an abundance of creatine. We did a whole podcast on creatine. You want to check it out, go back and hit it up and you can get some information on creatine real quick. In a nutshell, what does creatine do? When you have adequate amounts of creatine in the system, especially for individuals that lack creatine, who lacks creatine? Typically elderly. The other people that are going to lack it is vegetarians. Other people that are training ex extensively hard are going to lack creatine. And also people that have a low pro animal protein diet, okay, going to lack creatine for sure. What does creatine do? It's a creatine shuttle. And what it basically does is rejuvenates ATP very rapidly. It's the first typically like what we would call the 30 seconds of your, you know, your workout. So let's say, let's say for instance, you're, you're running a 40 yard dash. Yeah. Do you want creatine? Absolutely. Let's say you're running a hundred yard dash. Absolutely. Let's say you're running a quarter mile. Absolutely. So what it's going to do, it's going to rejuvenate ATP at an accelerated rate. All right, there's option one. Option two, it hydrates. That's one of the reasons why when you use creatine, it has a tendency to do what? It has a tendency to help you gain weight. It's going to be water weight and muscle weight because the other thing it does is stimulate muscle tissue synthesis at the TMOR, which is like right down in the RNA. It turns on the key, so to speak, for the muscle to be synthesized. The other thing that creatine does too, you ready for this? A couple little moments, helps to prevent injury situations, especially head trauma. So if you're a football player, you want to be using creatine. You're crazy if you're not. So anybody that's, or a soccer player, anybody, rugby, anything that's going to like have head to head contact or any type of concussion possibility, creatine is like number one, that sport. All right. So the combination of beta alanine and creatine together, 
That was one of the questions for years. Like, would beta alanine and creatine actually be better together? And so there was, ah, we haven't done any research. We haven't done any of this. And finally, about two years ago, the research starts stacking in. Hey, multi-ingredient pre-workouts containing creatine and beta alanine seem to actually not only help with recovery, improve stamina and strength, also work in other, other different areas such as like, you know, antioxidant protection and things of that nature. Yeah, it works together better. All right, so a lot of people have actually slipped these two out. A lot of people don't like the parathesis of fact so they oh, i don't want anything with beta alanine that stuff's gnarly i don't want anything with it and eh, depends on the sport you might want to relook at it all right so let's l keep rolling a little bit further another thing that's dominantly uh in most pre-workouts is arginine so arginine itself um obviously is an amino acid it's a specific uh, essential amino acid. What does it mean to be essential? We have essential amino acids. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a conditionally essential amino acid. So what does it mean ultimately that we're in a conditionally essential amino acid situation? Under situations that such as stress, growth, things of that nature, it becomes essential. What does it do? It does three dominant things. Number one, increases the release of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a vasodilating um, a substance that the body uses. It works in the endothelial tissue. What is endothelial? That means the heart tissue as well as the vascular system. And what it does is it increases circulation. A couple other things that it does in specific abundance. Okay, in fact, I, I wrote some of this stuff down. I thought it'd be kind of cool to go with this, all right? Obviously, vascular uh, vasodilation, it, re, it re, uh, speeds up recovery from injury. Any type of injury, it accentuates the synthesis of collagen. How many people are taking collagen now? A lot of people. Believe it or not, when you're using the arginine, it's going to be very, very effective to help the body start to synthesize its own collagen. Another thing that it does as well, too, is... It increases the release of growth hormone. We knew this back in the 80s. In fact, I had a guy, his name was Jomo Stevenson. He was like 19 or 18 years old. I, I trained him for a teenage Mr. America. He had 19-inch arms, right? So we ultimately started saying, you know what? Let's play with this arginine. I'm going to have you use about 10 grams because it takes about 6 grams to get a good GH release, maybe 8. So what we did is we had him take 5 grams roughly right when he would go to bed and then wake him up in the middle of the night because when your growth hormone secretes, it's usually about 1 or 2 in the morning. So then we'd fire him up with another dose. We'd, hey, get up, go to the bathroom, go pee, hit another dose of this arginine, and then go back to sleep. So we're cutting him up, and usually we would lose an inch or 2 inches off the arm. Why we're cutting him up? Typical game's over that normally happens. We put them on the arginine compound with ornithine together. And so what happened was we actually gained an inch on his arms. Pretty substantial moment. A lot of fun with that one. So here's the deal with arginine. Typically, you're going to find it in a pre-workout. It does, by the way, help the body to create and build more uh, creatine. So it does actually help with ATP. Another thing about arginine that's uh, very effective, it's very good for the immune system immune system recovery post-workout, making an exceptional product, all right? So a lot of people have problems with arginine. What's the problem? Well, if you have too much arginine in the diet, not enough lysine, it creates an imbalance that allows potential uh, herpes breakout. Herpes 1, herpes 2. And so what does that mean? Cold sore, fever blister, also possibility of shingles later on in life. And so a lot of people have started to kind of shy away from it and said, you know what I'll do? I'll take beets. I'll use beet extracts or beets and th that, things of that nature. And that's some of the new stuff that's out on the market. And it works great for nitrogen secretions and nitric oxide production, all these different things it works. But it doesn't do the same thing as arginine. It doesn't do the immune. It doesn't do the growth hormone. It doesn't do the same situation. So in my opinion, the beets is a great adjunct and you might want to put it in there, but let's face it, arginine would be the best. How do you fix that? You make sure you take some lysine throughout the day. By the way, Vince Gironda in his quest for growing people use lysine throughout the day. It's one of the number one components in milk, which all the old bodybuilders used to use to help with grow. All right, let's talk about something else that's kind of new. I was up in uh, Vegas probably about 20 years ago. And there's a company that came out with a product called D-Ribose. I asked him, so where did you get this D-Ribose stuff? And he said, well, originally we got it as a byproduct from Hormel. And they used to actually make, you know, hot dogs, obviously. And some of the, the like leftover substance was kind of sweet. They dug into it. It was a specific ribose, which ribose is a specific pentose sugar. It's part of the ATP. 
Someone comes up with the idea of, wow, why don't we concentrate some ribose, make it a different way, and let's start eating ribose like pre-workout and see if it works for endurance. So as typical, like with branch chains and everything else, what happens is people start playing with dosages. Well, we try a gram. Let's try two grams. Let's try three grams. Let's do all these different things. At the same time, Dr. Sinatra, one of the world's number one cardiologists on alternative medicine, was using it for his heart patients with incredible success. And so they finally settle in on a dose that actually looks appropriately right, and it's about 10 five to 10 grams a day and it actually seems to help with endurance and stamina recovery atp and making it a great substance to add in a lot of different things and you'll see it here and there one thing i didn't cover and i'm not going to cover a whole lot of it is we're not going to talk about the nootropics and we're going to talk about nootropics in another session but one of the things that happens with nootropics is oftentimes one of the things that you'll see in a pre-workout is going to be caffeine. So I've got a couple of different caffeine substances here. And there's new caffeines. There's fact, as far as I know, there's four different types of caffeines. Caffeine anhydrous, which is the quickest reactant. There's also caffeine derived from a green tea. There's also caffeine derived from green coffee bean. There's also caffeine that's a new, they call, and the name of it is actually new caffeine. It's actually a sustained release. A lot of companies are layering different types of caffeines to make them more effective or maybe give you a little little bit longer reaction. So caffeine ultimately has some very unique such, uh, unique situations. Believe it or not, it's an ergogenic aid. It does three dominant things. Obviously increases mental alertness and mental acuity, especially under times when people are fatigued. It also releases a substance out of the brain that tells you you don't have pain, which means that you can go further. And here's the controversy of controversies. Caffeine actually hydrates. You actually heard that right. You're telling me, no, dude, every time I drink coffee, I pee like a freight train. Yeah, you probably do, but the bottom line is, believe it or not, caffeine use on a regular basis actually helps with hydration. Oxymoron, all right? So here's another thing about caffeine, too, that's very interesting. When it comes to caffeine consumption, you have what they call responders and non-responders. Some people don't respond. You can give them 500 milligrams of this stuff. Doesn't work. I'm on the other end of the spectrum. A couple hundred milligrams, I'm wigged out forever. All right, now let's move on. One of the things that people did to try to fix the arginine problem, the people that didn't want the arginine, is they started using citrulline. What is citrulline? Citrulline is a compound that's basically formed from arginine in the arginine synthesis or the arginine pathway. And what it, citrulline actually does is it helps with creatine phosphate bolstering. So what it does is it becomes a buffer, almost like Beta alanine, a little bit different though, works in the system, helps to elevate ATP levels, helps with endurance, does have the vasodilation action that arginine has. So it's a vasodilator, it works as a buffering agent, helps with endurance and stamina. What does it not do? It doesn't kick out growth hormone, and it doesn't really seem to accentuate the body's recovery process when it comes to activation of our collagen synthesis. All right? So, Finally, branched chain amino acids, obviously branched chain amino acids are considered an anabolic agent. What does it mean to be anabolic? It means it causes tissue synthesis, causes the body to synthesize tissue, and ultimately uh, pre-workout being one of the best things that you can actually use. All right, so let's tear into some of these things, kind of have fun with it. Here's a newbie on the block, and we had these guys on the show, and this was the Zao guys. So we're going to look into their form. They, they use a inositol arginine salicylate, which basically gets much more effectiveness than just straight arginine. They also use the, the big dose of citrine, uh, cit citrulline malate. And then they use tart cherry combination, which has like bilberry and a bunch of other different stuff, which basically is supposed to help with the nitric oxide production. Great product. So you see it kind of slanted in this like kind of like more of a like open up the blood vessels, increase in dilation, kind of helping with that portion of it. I've used this and I actually responded to it very well. Typically, most arginine has a tendency to like kind of make me irritable and angry. That particular product worked effectively well. So let's talk about this Blue Bonnet. I love this company. They put out, put out a bunch of different stuff. And what they did is they did this. They go, okay, we did an energy blend. And so in our energy blend, they did the typical caffeine. They put tyrosine, which is an amino acid that you'll see on a common basis. Tyrosine kicks up the production of epinephrine and norepinephrine, which is excitatory neurotransmitters. The other thing they did is they put in here what is called muscle pump. And of course, what they did is they used the branch chains along with the creatine malate and actually giving you and the arginine to give you that muscle pump. And they also did what they call the nitric oxide blend, which has the arginine citrulline. 
Nice combination, perfect one to go. Here's one that's morphed throughout the years. This one's called Bang. And obviously with Bang, they had energy beverages and they end up getting heated from all sorts of different people like, oh my God, you're killing people, all that stuff, which obviously probably didn't happen. So anyways, the bottom line, what they ended up with this is they ended up using a branch chain combination with citrulline. They also use creatine, beta anhydrous. You probably see beta anhydrous. What is it? It's betaine. And what it does actually helps the body increase hydration. Very effective. It also has caffeine. And one of the other things that it has is acetyl L carnitine. Acetyl L carnitine, very effective for mental perkiness. I like using acetyl L carnitine, especially before I play basketball. It gives me the one more step quick advantage. All right, so here's another one that's popular Vital Performance. And they put out a pre workout. So in this particular one, they're using some branch chain. They actually use collagen peptides because they're a collagen company they got to put collagen in everything two and a half grams yeah whatever no win loss or whatever citrulline nice done beta anhydrous once again for the hydration creatine in a small dose it's like not even a gram so constant use of this would probably be helpful for the atp but it's really not going to be major for the muscle building the other thing it ends up having in here too is some um a specific Elevate ATP. So this Elevate literally is an apple extract. So a lot of times what people are trying to do is find a quicker, easier, more concentrated versus the beta alanine. And that's what they ended up doing on that one. All right. So here's another fun one. Very similar in its makeup. You know, with the arginine, the citrullines, the ar uh, compounds. So one of my favorite ones, though, is this one. It's called Stout. It's called to Total Performance. Yeah, does it have creatine? It does. It has five grams effective dosage. Have beta alanine? Yes, it does. It has three grams effective dosage. Does it have citrulline? Yes, it does. Three grams effective dosage. The tyrosines, the caffeines in huge dosages. If it didn't have caffeine, I'd be tempted. This stuff will knock you out and get you rolling. It's one of the, my favorite ones to sell for those guys that want the crack effect. All right, so that kind of gives you a little history on what you know pre-workouts were, where some of the ingredients came from, and maybe some of the new things that are out there, kind of changing and tweaking those formulas that you've seen throughout the years, kind of giving you an idea. Hopefully, this will help you shop, also help you better knowledge of what to look for in a pre-workout.